So much that we can come together and uh, remember. I think a lot of what we read about in the Bible is remembering. It's remembering what you've done in the past, and it's examining that evidence to inform the present today, Lord God. When we feel like things aren't real great, um, or maybe we've forgotten. So many times in the Scripture, we're just encouraged to remember, to remember what you've done, um, to remember how you've brought us through. Remember how you brought your people through the wilderness and and over the river and um, past all these different temptations, Lord God. And I pray that would just inform our worship today, that we could just pause for 30 seconds, one minute, and just remember specific situations, specific times in our life where we really felt like uh, it was it, whether it was a relationship or it was uh, the death of someone special and important to us, or uh, maybe even when we left a church that we were part of for a long time or a job or one of our kids, um, you know, kind of that relationship broke. We just pray that you would help us remember how you brought us through it. And if we're in those situations, help us remember and remind us that you will bring us through it, Lord God. So thank you so much.
dancing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Yes, I will. Jesus. 
Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty fortress, you go before Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. If I fight, and if I fight, I'll fight on my knees. My hands are too. Good to see all you guys here this morning, and you that are listening online, thank you for being part of this with us. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 this morning, we're going to talk about the letter to Sardis. We're wading through these seven letters, and I just want to say I think I'm speaking for myself as well as Blake. Uh, It has just been a real joy uh, to study these letters and to share them with you. And to cover the subject that we covered all year this year, I think back 10 or more years ago when I first came to this church, somebody invited me to Ironworks. I believe we started at 7 o'clock back then, I think. But PR, he was merciless back there, man. And... And I, and I got there, and here he, he just, we'd have some fellowship and some, uh, some food, and then he'd just sit down with a bunch of us all gathered around and just teach the Word. Same thing he did every other time that he got in the pulpit. And, and I thought, this is so, I've been in men's meetings before, but this was just so neat. And, uh, and I, I've come to believe that, that uh, God blesses efforts that honor his word. And so that's what we want to we continue to do here. Lord, uh, we ask you this morning that you would be with us, uh, as you always promise you will be. Bless us where we need to be blessed. Teach us what we need to be taught. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. It's a short, uh, short letter, shorter than most of them. <clears throat> Here John starts out, And to the angel of the church of Sardis, write these things. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, and that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent, therefore. If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the, from the book of life. But will, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Some stiff words in those short verses. Uh, this morning we're not going to spend a lot of time on the history of Sardis, much the same as the other churches we've been studying. Steeped in idol worship, they had a temple there to Artemis or Diana, whichever, whatever you call the false god 
that they worshiped there. It was full of debauched worship, uh, immoral worship. Uh, they also participated heavily in emperor worship. So it's much the same as the other churches. But I think it was interesting. Let's take a look at the way he introduces himself, the way he describes himself. These things says he in verse 1, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now what is the seven spirits of God? You know, the Bible doesn't mention that a whole lot. There are a few verses, so let's take a look elsewhere what the Bible says about the seven spirits of God. Revelation 4, 5, in John's vision, he was in the throne room of heaven, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So there he describes the seven spirits of God of these seven lamps of fire that were burning in the throne room and before the throne. Revelation 5, 6. And I looked, and behold, and in the midst of the throne, and from the four, uh, four living creatures, and the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. This is obviously Christ. And on him, we see these, uh, this description of seven horns and seven eyes. Now, and he calls that the seven spirits of God. Now, this is obviously figurative language. When John uh, first sees Christ appear to him on the Isle of Patmos, he doesn't describe him with these eyes and with these horns. So there is something very significant about this vision and this figurative language. Isaiah, the prophet, gives us uh, a little more insight into this idea of the seven spirits of God. Isaiah 11, verses 1, 2, and 3, the prophet wrote, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall, catch this, rest upon him, that is the Messiah, Jesus, and the, and the Spirit of Wisdom, and the spirit of understanding, and the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Seven aspects that Isaiah gives us here that makes up the spirit of God. We also see an example of this if we, I believe we have a picture of the, uh, do we get that picture of the menorah? There you go. Uh, if you look, the menorah was, uh, part of the furniture in the tabernacle in the temple and we also see it in the throne room of God. John just described it. And you can see that each one of those stems uh, represents an aspect that I just read to you from Isaiah. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the Lord resting on, on the Lord, and the spirit of fear and might and understanding. This is the Holy Spirit this is a rep representation of the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. This models, as we uh, have studied many times, the, the tabernacle, the temple, were really a model, an earthly model of the throne, throne room of heaven in some ways. And this menorah models the Holy Spirit anointed in all his fullness and it lights the throne, it, it lit the tabernacle, it lit the temple, it lights the throne room of heaven and will eventually light the whole world. The NLT translates this seven spirits of God as the sevenfold spirit of God, which is probably a little better translation of, of that verse. This is Christ, this sevenfold spirit of God, this is Christ in possession of the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. And, and he also has the seven pastors. He is what this church needs, as we'll see as we go through these verses. Now let's, let's go back. We're going to just uh, kind of take those, these verses apart. In verse 1, he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Ouch. That's a pretty biting statement, isn't it? 
Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God, meaning not found them complete. He's saying you have works that you started, finish them. You're not doing what you were sent there to do. A companion verse might be uh, Colossians 4.12. Paul wrote, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. This is what was lacking in this church. The, the believers of this church were not standing perfect and complete in, in doing all the will of God that he had sent them there to do. There's two different words there translated perfect. Same basic meaning, meaning to fill up, to complete. There was a lot of things lacking there. Verse 3. Verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Sound familiar? Very similar statement to the church at Ephesus. In chapter 2, he says, I'll come quickly and remove your lampstand. Jesus is not pleased with his church being neglected. Better to have no church at all than a, than a group of believers coming together not doing the will of God. Verse 4, you still have a few names, in, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. They walk with me in... They, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. A supporting verse Paul wrote in uh, Colossians 1.10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of, of God. This is, again, what was not happening in this church at Sardis. People were not walking worthy in the Lord, not pleasing him, not being fruitful in the works that they were there to do, and not caring enough to be to increase their knowledge of God. But God always has a remnant in every generation. He said some here in Sardis are, are, are his remnant. Not everyone just went along to get along with the unbelievers in that city. Verse 5, he says, the overcomers will be clothed in white, and their name will not be blotted out of the book of life. And take notice, he says, will not. I will not blot them out. He doesn't say, I, I could blot them out. I might blot them out. Uh, this is not a treatise on whether you lose your salvation or not. In uh, Revelation 22, he talks about removing names. But if, we, if you look at the context, he's talking there to non-believers. So uh, this is, these people walking in white and walking with the Lord, their salvation is secure. That's a whole study right there in that, that, little, there, that little area about blotting your name out, which we do not have time to cover today, maybe sometime in the future. But I want to kind of zero in now on this idea of you, were, you have a reputation of being alive, but he says you are dead. What does that look like? What, is a, what does a dead church look like? Perhaps if we went into another church tomorrow morning, we might find a place that is very quiet and very subdued. They don't go around shaking hands and buzzing and talking to each other. And, and it's very different than ours. And we might say, wow, that church is really dead. Uh, I knew I visited a church in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They, were, they called themselves Plymouth Brethren. And they were very stoic, very quiet. They had no in musical instruments. They had no choir. Uh, they, they sang a cappella. They had no full-time paid pastor. Only uh, the men took turns teaching every Sunday. And we might look at that and go, wow, that's really dead. I don't think that's what he was talking about here. We might listen to the teaching in a church and say, well, that's not the way Pastor Randy teaches. That's not, uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty low key. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Uh, I knew a, I knew of a, a pastor who was also a 
full-time teacher in, at a college and his messages that he taught for years and years and years and years was the exact same thing that he gave in his college classes. It was like sitting in a college class lecture. And some of us might say, well, that's kind of dead. Again, I don't believe that's what he's talking about here. How about a church that's very formal, very liturgical, reads a lot of creeds, everything they do is printed out in their bulletin ahead of time. I don't believe that was what he's talking about here. How about the music? We may go into another church and listen to the music and find that it is very subdued. And uh, my wife and I visited 10th Presbyterian in downtown Philadelphia many years ago, Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, marvelous, marvelous Bible teacher. And their music was highbrow music. I mean, they played classical type music, Bach, Beethoven, and, and all that kind of style. And some of us might look at that and go, gee, that's kind of dead. But, you know, a friend of mine told me one time, I believe that, that God is going to play in the throne room of heaven bluegrass music because, because uh, you know, that's, that's the only kind of music that could fit in the throne room of heaven. I think he was a bit prejudiced because he was from Virginia. But I don't believe any of these descriptions here would, would describe what he's talking about when he says you have a reputation of being alive but you're dead remember the church is made up of individual believers who come together to form the body of Christ a dead church equals spiritually dead people let's look at a couple of verses that support this Ephesians 2 1 and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins He's talking here about being spiritually dead. Not the way we practice our worship. Because there are many various different types of worship that people are comfortable with. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.5. He says, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians 5.14, therefore he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Light does not go to those who are dead, light goes to those who are alive. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This church was once alive, but now it was once alive like, like the, uh, the church at Ephesus, like the church we're going to study in Philadelphia, but now it's dead and dying. And it's filled with, I think, these kind of people. Number one, it's filled with unconverted people. People who have a bent for religious things, but they've never put their faith and trust in Christ. They're like the, the folks in Matthew that approach Christ in the, in the judgment day, and they say, hey, what about us? Didn't we do this, that, and the other thing? And he says, depart from me, you that work iniquity, because I never knew you. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power of, of Christ in 2 Timothy 3, 5. The second group of people that may be prevalent in this church are people who are converted, but they only consume milk. They're immature. They still walk in the flesh, 2 Peter 2, 10. But there's a third group in this church, and it sounds like a small group, a few that have not defiled their garments. A few to those who say, who, uh, to those he says, be watchful, strengthen what has not yet died. So there was some life in that church. I, I remember years ago as a, as a kid, the church that I grew up in was a reformed Lutheran church who combined with some other churches and formed the United Church of Christ. And that group long ago in the 50s had decided that the Bible only contains the Word of God. 
it not, it not is, that it is the Word of God. And so therefore, it really started to die. But you know, I remember as a little kid, one particular guy who was a Sunday school teacher, and I was in his Sunday school class for years and years growing up, and he was just a godly man. He loved the Lord. He gave all of us in his, that went through his class a little pocket New Testament. I still have that pocket New Testament in my toolbox at work. I've had it all these years. And I'm seeing there, there's a man who was still part of this church, but he was, he was part of the group that was alive. And he was doing what he could to keep the church alive. And he taught many things that I, from the Bible, the old, Bible, the old Testament Bible stories that I'm sure had an effect on me and eventually helped me to come to Christ. So, what causes a church, a church body, or an individual of a church, what causes them to die? Well, I'm convinced, guys, that it starts with the view, their view, of the Word of God. Think about the Reformation, how it swept through Central Europe, starting in Germany, swept all through Central Europe, and eventually around the world, even to our continent. But it took those of the Enlightenment, those who are rationalists, those who are higher critics, just a little bit more than 400 years to, to, uh, to put a damper on that and usher in Nazism, which brought absolute devastation on that same area of the world, many other areas of the world. Think of the great Methodist movement that the Wesley started. Today, it's pretty much dead. Now that's not the case everywhere. There's a Methodist church in our very community that still holds to the inspiration of Scripture. They want their kids to be taught the Bible in vacation Bible school. And they're probably going to end up separating from the mainline denomination because of some of the crazy things that they're starting to allow in. So this is not just, uh, deadness is not just attached to a name, particular name. Many mainline denomination churches have adhered to this idea of higher criticism, which destroys the foundation of the scripture and what they really have to teach. Because without the Bible, without the truth of the scripture, they really don't have anything of many, much value to teach. Some groups who have not uh, denied the scripture have, have gone dead because what has become more important to them is their, is their product, their name, their reputation, their style of music. That will kill a church as, just, as, just as easy as the other. If a body of believer, believers honor the word of God, he will use them to reach the world. Now we might sit back this morning and say, well, that's never going to happen at Calvary Chapel. We're founded on the principle that the word of God is the main thing. And we honor the Word of God, and that's, that's really part of our roots. It's in our DNA. I think what Jesus says to us is be careful. Watch. If you have an ear to hear, listen to what I'm saying to the, to the churches. We are not immune. Because we had a good start, we are not immune to this thing happening to our church or our, our movement. It has happened around the world throughout the centuries. It can happen here. Let it be said of us, never that you were once alive, but now you're dead. Let's be diligent about keeping the main thing the main thing. That is the infallible, inerrant word of God at the center of everything we do. How do we keep things alive? How do we keep life going in our personal daily life, in our life of our church, in the life of our community? Paul gives us a really good verse, Colossians 3.16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now just look at those words. He starts out with, the, with the, the statement, the Word of God. The Word of God. This is not your favorite 
radio preacher. This is not even what your preacher shares with you on Sunday morning. This is not the ironworks message. All those things should drive us to the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that we should make, should dwell in us richly. It should become an integral part of our life. It will develop in you wisdom. Wisdom in how you treat others, how you make decisions. He says teaching, that's sharing the truth with others and helping them to grow in grace. He says admonishing one another, challenging each other, like iron sharpens iron, what we do here at Ironworks. Singing and praising with spiritual songs. That's probably not going to be, you're probably not going to get this kind of effect by listening to Black Sabbath on the radio in your car. Singing and praising spiritual songs to the Lord. It will bring grace to your hearts. Guys, that little verse there, that's describing life. That's what was lacking in this church. And that's what he's telling us today. Make sure that, be, that stays the main thing that you focus on. Well, let's go to small groups and talk this stuff over a little bit. How about that? Thank you, Lord, for challenging us this morning to keep your word in the center of our lives and keep life pumped into our lives and the lives of those around us. May it never be said of you, of us, that you guys are dead. I know you used to be alive. We don't ever want to have that to be part of our story. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.